It, uh, National Women's Council of Ireland, Orla O'Connor and Francis Byrne, and this presentation will be for 10 minutes. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you for inviting the National Women's Council of Ireland to come and speak to you. I will be speaking on Francis Byrne, who's a board member of the National Women's Council and also director of OPEN, which is the largest lone parent organisation. We'll be combining this contribution. So, just first of all, for those of you who don't know, the National Women's Council of Ireland, we're the leading national women's members organisation, and we have a very diverse range of women's groups throughout the country. And our aim is to lead and to be a catalyst of change in the achievement of equality between men and women in Ireland. And in our policies, we really try to reflect the lived experiences of women across Ireland. And for this constitutional convention, we held quite a, a large consultation process. And obviously, this article was very core to that consultation process and to the issues that women were raising. So from our point of view, what's wrong with the current provision is that it's critical in, in the first instance, and it's, it's been said a few times today, that this article really does ascribe a particular role to women in Irish society. It ascribes to women a life within the home, and also absolutely talks about women as mothers and primary carers. And it is interesting to note that even in 1937, women campaigned against the in inclusion of this article. And they particularly emphasised that it was a far cry from the proclamation of 1916. But in 2013, it certainly does not reflect the reality of women's lives. And nor does it reflect, in the National Women's Council's view, the type of society that we wish to aspire to, and that we believe that our constitution should be showing in a very symbolic way the type of society that we want to become. We all know in this room that women work inside the home, women work in paid employment, women have their own businesses, women work on farms, and for many women, they combine care and working life in many different ways. Women's lives are complex, as are men's, and at different times in their lives, they want more time for support, for care, for children, for parents and relatives. And at other times, it's about focusing more on, our career, on careers. And also, it's about providing far greater work and life balance. And I think that was really eloquently put by, by the last um, question from the floor. I didn't catch your name. But the article also does not reflect the reality of care and care work, because it does take place not just in the home, but in, within our, uh, our creches, our nursing homes, our communities, within neighbourhoods. So it takes place in so many different places that this article does not reflect. And I think, and I'm glad um, Professor Jared White said it, in our view, and it was absolutely the view of, of women in our consultation process, the article is blatantly sexist and it's just not appropriate anymore. And while it has been said that the article has never been directly applied in the courts, the state has developed many forms of discrimination in terms of the policies that have been developed um, around women and women's rights. And we've heard already that until 1973, women were forced to give up employment when they got married. Currently now, less than 60% of women of pensionable age receive a contributory state pension because of the care work that was not recognised. And also, we've seen a complete absence of policies to, to support uh, father's leave and paternity leave. We have a completely limited version of parental leave that we, would, uh, we only have because we were forced to do so from the EU, but we adopted it in, in, in such a limited way and we made it unpaid, which made it very difficult for, for people to take up. So there's been a whole push in terms of policies and in terms of any advancement about reinforcing the role that women, a woman is the primary carer. And, and men's role within that is, has not been considered or taken into account in terms of the development of policy. So what we would like to see in the Constitution, we're saying that a new article needs to be developed that both reflects the current realities, but also aspires to a view on how care should be valued in our society. And it should be based around three principles. It should be gender neutral, because we believe that would recognise care work done by both women and men, and also aspire to a greater sharing of care work between women and men. It should recognise that care work is done inside the home, but also much broader than that within our wider communities. And we think that that would give a symbolic recognition to the idea that we want to value all care work in society. And it should also indicate that caring for each other and care work is essential for the good of everyone in our society. Because it's about placing care at the centre of the constitution and saying that it's part of the common good. 
And we believe this would actually, this would make a difference. And I think that's really important in terms of this discussion on the Constitution is, you know, what difference would, would these changes make? It would give symbolic recognition to the valuable work that's currently done by thousands of women and many, many men every day in Ireland. It would, in our view, invite men to take on more responsibility and enjoy the often very rewarding work of care. And it would also widen the value of care work within our society. And in, in our view, that would allow for more support to be sought from carers, although it wouldn't offer full legal protection. So from a National Women's Council perspective, we want to create a society where we all benefit from receiving and giving care. And we hope that you will consider those three uh, principles. And I'm now going to just ask Francis to come and talk to you. Hello, good morning. It's been a really interesting discussion um, so far and a huge honour to be part of it. I suppose when I was a younger woman, um, I instinctively, and I see people tweeting about this this morning, why not scrap it? And that's certainly how I would have felt really angry about this article um, growing up. But actually, I've come to the conclusion over the years, maybe with a bit of maturity, but the experience of being a lone mother myself and advocating on behalf of other one-parent families has actually informed and cemented the view that what we need to do is reform this article. And I hope that the perspective as a board member of the Women's Council, but also wearing the hat um, for advocating for lone parents, I hope that when I finish speaking, you'll understand why. Our constitution is important symbolically and legally. I think the two experts this morning um, would, would have convinced you of that if you weren't convinced before you came into the room. And as I think there seems to be widespread agreement, the article under debate today communicates a very sexist view about and to men and women. But in terms of what it has, the impact that it has had, while it might be very limited legally and, and what has happened, when it comes to policy development, it, act, it actually has led to what has become known as the male breadwinner model in our social welfare system and beyond. And the last, this has had a profound impact on the lives of one parent families, whether they're led by mothers or fathers. A few words about our families. We're a very diverse group. The roots into lone parenthood are varied. They include, sadly, death, separation following cohabitation or marriage, and they're the single biggest group of us who find ourselves being lone parents. Divorce, obviously, more recently in Ireland. And there are, of course, roots, including the institutionalisation of the other parent, whether it's prison or elsewhere, and, of course, crisis pregnancy. Today, there are about, depending on how you measure it, if you take the general census figures for measuring families, there are just over 620, almost 630,000 families in Ireland with children under the age of 20. And of those, about 140,658 of us are lone parents, the majority being mothers and about 13,000 are dads. And between us, we rare we have much smaller families than other families, it's important to say, and between us we rare just under 140,000 of the almost one million children in Ireland today. And from Open's point of view, it's not that we don't care about lone parents who aren't on a social welfare payment or aren't in low income, but we came together as an anti-poverty network. So at the centre of our interests are the parents who are receiving the one parent family payment or who indeed are low income in other ways and not receiving a social welfare payment. So what impact has this article had? Well, we would argue that it has led to a social welfare system that understands, as I said, a male breadwinner model, which means men provide and women stay at home. So we, have, as a society, have ended up with piecemeal policy development. On the one hand, 98% of those in the one-parent family payment are mothers, and as such, actually get a payment in their own right, which in some ways you could argue was actually an effort to enshrine 41.2 in social welfare law. But it also means that latterly in the last few years, our mothers are singled out as a group of mothers like no other and activated to go out to work. So actually the article hasn't provided that protection. And when it comes to lone fathers, and there's been some mention of this in the room, let me just say that they say that they feel totally lost in a system which actually doesn't expect to find men parenting alone at all. And as we have said, around 14% of us are lone dads. 
So this has all led to a very haphazard approach to policy development, has created a very strong sense of social exclusion. And as we have seen in the latest poverty figures this week, has led to growing levels, sadly, of child poverty. When it comes to making the choice, as one of the members of the convention was speaking about earlier, about going out to the labour market, here's what lone parents say. We're damned if we do and damned if we don't. If you choose to go out into the labour market, you have a very big, complex social welfare, welfare to work system to deal with that hasn't been designed for anyone's needs, but has a particular impact on our families. And like other parents, you enter workplaces, which in most cases don't have family friendly provision. If you don't work outside the home, you are liable to be made feel like a so-called welfare sponger, ironically, while you remain as some of the poorest families in Ireland, as again we have seen this week in the poverty figures. So having advocated now for almost 20 years for social welfare changes, which is vital, we conclude that one of the core things that needs to happen is that 41.2 needs to be revised and amended. It leaves all of us as parents, whether we're parenting alone or not, in a very strange limbo. And I should say for clarity, all of the changes which Open looks for, and this is true of the National Women's Council as well, we look for for all families, we look for for all members of society. In this instance, as a member of the Women's Council board, I am communicating to you and offering the perspective of sole parent and sole breadwinners. But actually, it's for everybody in society. So what could this convention do? As Orla has described, this convention could do all families and all members of our society a huge service. I think you already are. I hope that doesn't sound patronising. A recommendation to change Article 41.2 might, at a minimum, afford us with an opportunity to have a long overdue and very welcome debate about childcare, elder care and other supports which all of us in society need or will need and we totally deserve. And it's not just, as Orla has said, about home-based care. It's about an ethic of care in our homes but also in our education settings, our workplaces, our institutions, all of them, and in public and private service provision. We would strongly recommend a revised Article 41.2 which would re reflect the realities of all family forms in the 21st century, give care its proper standing and place, and which would recognise that it is an essential part of a society which truly respects the rights and needs of all of its citizens equally, including those, as Siobhan Mullally has said, who receive care and support in our society. So thank you for the honour of addressing you, and we wish you luck and care in your deliberations. Thank you.